Good morning. Oh, we got to try that one again. Who, who's awake? Who's alive this morning? Good morning. What's up? Good morning. Let's stand up and get ready to worship, guys. Welcome to church. If you guys are in the lobby, come on in. It is warm in here. There's joy in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, good morning to everybody in our online community as well. It's great to have you guys with us. I'm going to open up in a quick word of prayer this morning. You guys join me in prayer. Lord, we welcome your presence, Lord. We welcome your glorious presence into this place this morning, Lord. Have your way. Have your way, Lord. We worship you in spirit and in truth, God. We enter your gates this morning with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. Um, from the second that we come in here, Lord, we just give you the honor and the glory that you are due, Lord. We recognize, God, that you, you are Lord and you are great and you are glorious, Lord. Let your presence fill this room right here, right now, God. Let your presence fill our hearts right here, right now. Whatever we've come into this space with, God, we just lay down at the foot of the cross right now. We just lay it down at the foot of the cross, God, because you are worthy of our praise. We're not worried. We're not anxious. We're not... Um, we're not distracted. We're not thinking about anything but the cross and about who, how great you are, how good you are, how, how steadfast you are, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Um, there's a scene in The Chosen. How many of you guys have seen The Chosen and out there? There's a scene in The Chosen. I think it's like, I know it's season one. I think it maybe is episode one um, where it's like Mary. Um, and Mary is in the darkest situation of her life. And all Jesus does is calls her name. Um, and when, when I sing this song, I think about that. And I, I just think of the Lord calling my name. And I, I think of him calling me out of my fear, out of my sin, out of my doubt, out of my insecurity, and, and into the life that he calls me to live. Um, and so God is calling your name this morning. He knows you by name. He knows every hair on your head. He knows you by name, and he's calling your name this morning. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave. I'm gonna leave the grave behind out of the darkness into your glorious day. All my doubts and fears are dead. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Oh, out of the darkness into your glorious day. Hallelujah. power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. When the Lord is in this room, doubt has to flee. Fear has to bow down at the feet of our King. begin to lift the name of Jesus. Jesus. i 
darkness tremble Jesus Jesus you silence for you Jesus Jesus you made the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus your name Jesus Jesus you made honest nothing else matters when the Lord is in this room cause he's healing every heart he's restoring every heart cause nothing else matters when there's a king in this room so how can I help I know I'll never be alone. Come on. And I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free? Come on. There is a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire There is another in the fire And all my dad left for dead beneath the water I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore, hallelujah. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning, either way I will bow to the things of this world. And I know
is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come on me in the space between what it used to be in this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. Church, I want to sing that verse out with confidence this morning. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come on, man. So come on, man, in the space between all the things unseen. In this reckoning, and I know I will never be alone. Said I know, and I know I will never be alone. I will never, and I know I will never be alone. Sing one more time, every voice across this place. I know, and I know I will never be alone. There'll be another. distance, no strive, just hearing you love, no distance, no strive, I'm just hearing you love, no distance, no striving anymore, this a declaration this morning. Let's make this a declaration over not just Sunday, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Let's make this a declaration over our lives. There's another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need a reminder? What power set me free There is a grave that holds nobody And now that power lives in me There's a grave There is a grave that holds nobody And now that power lives in me Hallelujah Hallelujah Worship you, Lord. How could I express 
could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must end, and God, you never do. So I throw my hands, praise you again and again, cause all that Get up. 
I'm on my soul. Don't you get shy on me and lift up your soul. You've got a lion inside of us. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, every voice across this room. Oh, come on, my soul. I said, come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me. You've got a lion inside Yeah. Get up and praise the Lord. Get up and praise the Lord. And I'll, and I'll raise him. Hallelujah. In the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah And I will watch the darkness flee And I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody And I raise a hallelujah Sing, I'm gonna sing. And I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roar, and up from the ashes, the hope will arise. The death is defeated, the king is alive. I'm gonna sing, and I'm gonna. bring calm where there is fear bring assurance oh work in this moment oh thank you Lord Lord we love you we trust you you are the source of our life it is you that we're dependent on in Jesus name Amen. Amen. Were you, this turned into a double act. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, can we hear it for Nick? Come on, I, somebody. I, I said we, I didn't know how to end it. I guess he ended it, right? <laughs> I guess. All right. God bless everybody. You can be seated. Um, 
Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what are my notes? What, what am I supposed to say here? Uh, hey, um, what? Jeez. Uh, I'm glad you're here. Amen. Um, so, uh, there's just no good way to start. <laughs> Can we just uh, totally identify that? <laughs> um, so I'm just going to jump in with the super awkwardness of, of saying, um, you know, we got to get started. But uh, just blessed to be able to uh, worship his name this morning, right? Amen. Amen. Um, you know, we talk a lot about next steps here at Word of Life, and uh, one of those next steps is life groups. And what an opportunity it has been. I know for, um, I can speak pers on a personal level with my wife and I being involved in life groups for many, many years and the life change that happens through those life groups. And I, I want you to say that's not just a, a rehearsed speak. That is something that has gotten us through life in many different ways. And so um, if you are on the fence about joining a life group or thinking about like, ah, is this something that I'm really interested in doing? I encourage you to look at it. The life group signups start today and they are live on our website, wordoflifeag.org. Um, you can go there or if you've downloaded the Church Center app, um, on your smartphone, you can click on that. Uh, there's a link right there to sign up for Life Groups. Encourage you to be a part of that. Um, it, it really is amazing. And uh, don't take my word fully for it. Uh, I'm going to direct you to the screens because there's some really great uh, testimonies of uh, people experiencing life change in Life Groups. So watch ahead. Hey, I'm Bryce, uh, and this is my story. I loved this church, and but for the first couple years, I would just come and sit in a pew. And uh, I connected with uh, Dave and Mary Zare. I believe it was Dave and Mary both approached me after service and said that, yeah, you should come. We see you bring uh, your son to uh, Royal Rangers on Wednesday. Just while he's there, just come and join our life group. And I would have never, never done it. But uh, something told me that it's time to break out of your comfort zone. It's time to be a part of this church. I had started coming to church here, I think in 2014. Um, and like I said, I hadn't really connected with anybody, just kind of in and out on Sundays and then decided, hey, why don't I sign up for a life group? Um, but at the same time, I'd been like dating for years and online dating. And if you've ever done that, it's, you know, it is what it is. It kind of becomes a hobby. Anyway, it was a Tuesday night, and I did my little search, and I found this guy here, Bryce. Um, it was really crazy because I searched for the same stuff a lot, never found him. Um, but he, like, hit most of my, you know, superficial criteria that I had. And uh, sent him a message. He didn't respond, but that's, it is what it is. And lo and behold, the next night was my first life group and I walked in and he was sitting across from me. About halfway through, I thought, hmm, I think I like him. And so I sent him a message on the same dating website asking what the life group homework was. Even though I knew what it was, I just thought I'd send the message. And then we started talking and kind of the rest is history. Some of the people that I've met in life group have become great accountability partners. They've become great friends. And some of the teachers have become my family. Small groups allow me and teach me how to love the Lord better and love the people around me better in a, in a different and needed way. What stuck with me and what I needed in that time was the, the time with these other young people like myself from this church to hang out and eat food and uh, talk with them about stuff that fills the rest of my week with the Lord. Here's the truth, and the truth is, is that when I joined the life group, I sat in the circle the first day and I looked at everyone and I said, I don't even know if God's real. I really don't. With everything that's going on, everything I've gone through in my life, everything that I'm going through with special needs son and move, I just don't feel 
I don't feel it, but I'm here and I'm gonna keep trying because I just don't feel like he speaks to me. And, I, and somebody leaned over to me and said, the fact that you're here and you're looking for him, he's going to reach you, he's with you, just keep coming. That's exactly what life groups are for. <laughs> That's exactly what they're for. Like, they are for the people who don't have it figured out, which, uh, believe it or not, ends up being all of us. It really does. You're gonna get there and, and there's something's gonna happen. There's gonna, you know, even if it's not, even if you don't find your husband there, um, <laughs> you'll find connection or you'll, you know, you'll hear something or something will click. It's, you know, there's, there's something different every week or, you know, in every part of the conversation. I feel that my mission on earth is to witness to other people. And luckily I'm in a position at my job where I get a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with other people and there is a lot of gospel spread. And I feel like life groups help me break out of my comfort zone and uh, it, it, it gave me the courage to witness to other people too. You can't do church alone. You, God doesn't want us to do it alone. So we come here on Sunday. I don't think that's what he means, just going to church. You need your warrior team, even in the weekday. And the transformation is life-changing. Life group signups are now live. To sign up for a life group, visit our website. That's www.wordoflifeag.org and tap on the card that says Life Groups. From there, you can scroll through our awesome list of groups this cycle. Check it out. This week, we are rebooting our Church Word series with a message from Pastor Tom. Today, we're talking all about the word hallelujah. Come on, church. Let's give Pastor Tom a huge welcome this morning. Well, good morning, Word of Life. It's great to be able to come and share some with you that I hope will be helpful. Um, but first things, I want to share some uh, personal news with everybody. Uh, a week ago, um, the Friday before last, uh, I went to Syracuse, and along with five other people, we stood and took an oath to become American citizens, which was pretty cool. So... Uh, no longer a green card holder. Um, that means I can vote and sit on a jury now, so that's exciting. Um, but it was pretty cool. They had us all stand up, and we had to you know, raise our right hand, and they said, you know, do you swear to uphold the Constitution of the United States? And we all had to say, I do. If required by law, are you willing to bear arms on behalf of the United States? I do. And then they said, if America and England ever get to the World Cup final, will you cheer for America? So I did one of those, and I do. But it's all irrelevant because America are never going to get to the World Cup final. But I didn't realize it was going to stir some emotion. Okay, I'm cool with that. But we are, um, we're coming back and we're revisiting a series that we did. It was last summer now. Uh, so we did a series called Church Words and it ran over six weeks. And in that series, we looked at an individual word each week that you wouldn't typically hear outside of a church environment or outside of a conversation around the things of faith. So there are different words that you and I will use. If, if you're a follower of Jesus and you've been around church for a little while, there are words that you and I will use, perhaps from the Bible or perhaps we, words that we use to describe different things that if you do, don't come from a church context, makes no sense or it requires some explanation, or in popular culture has a different meaning. And so the words that we covered last summer were the words holy, grace, disciple, and then Annie Bullard did a great week and she talked on the word sin, we talked about the word saved, and we talked about the word repent. And every week of those, uh, that six-week series from last summer, we dug in, we looked at what those words had to mean, what we could learn from those. And I can say for myself, I loved researching the words that I was uh, able to come and share. And this week, we're going to dig into the word hallelujah. Hallelujah. So part seven of this series is the word hallelujah. And uh, I had somewhat of a shock this week as I came to the Bible and uh, I use a website called Bible Gateway. And so I went on there and I typed in the word hallelujah, hit search, and there were no results. So then I was like, okay, I have to have spelt this wrong. So then I tried sort of moving the L's around a little bit and tried, you know, switching a few vowels, nothing. And so I kept searching, and fortunately for me, while I was doing this, Megan was in my office, 
And so as I'm trying to sort of do this search, I'm sort of muttering under my breath, and I'm, you know, clearly, clearly and I'm frustrated. Like, it's the word hallelujah. How is this not in the Bible? It's like the most Bible word ever. And so as I'm searching, she kind of goes, well, you know, it's a Hebrew thing, right? I was like, how, what's that now? He says it's a Hebrew word. And so what I found out is that in my English translation, I primarily use the New Living Translation. It's a newer translation. I think it's, uh, it's faithful to the original languages as well as has a great readability. So I primarily use the New Living Translation. And the New Living Translation, they'd actually translated the word hallelujah to be praise the Lord. And so as I start to look into that, I sort of started to be able to find some more about hallelujah. But it was a frustrating 20 minutes for me. And thank God my wife was there to help me out. But the word hallelujah, we use it often in worship songs. We sang it today. The word hallelujah comes up in conversation. You may have heard somebody, or you, you, myself, uh, you know, something good happens. Say hallelujah, as in praise, you know, thank the Lord, thank the Lord, praise the Lord. It's part of our common vernacular as Christians. It's part of our songs. It's part of our conversation. It's part of the things that we say is this word hallelujah. And so if we're going to say it as often as we do, and if we're going to sing it as often as we do, I think it's worthwhile diving in to see what we can learn by looking a little closer at this word hallelujah. Because I will say it would be a true tragedy if it became just another churchy word that has lost its potency because we've never considered what it means. So the basic definition of hallelujah is simply hallelujah equals praise the Lord. Hallelujah equals praise the Lord. Now, hallelujah and where they get this very basic definition is that there's a composite of two Hebrew words. So the first is halal. And that means uh, simply praise. And uh, back in April, I sort of looked at that word as part of a, a message on Psalm 113. And I came up with then by looking into it that praise is shine and loudly boast about. So that's praise. And then Yah, J-A-H, the J is pronounced with a Y sound. So is uh, the Lord, Yah. And that's abbreviated form of Yahweh, the formal name of God. So halal, praise, Yah, the Lord. And we could stop there. And this would be the shortest message you've ever heard in your life. Now, some of you are like, that'd be fine with me. We doing three minute messages now. But there's a little more as I dug into this that was really helpful. And it really was a blessing to me as I dug into it this week. So I want to share some of the stuff that I, uh, I sort of unearthed as I sort of got into it. But first, I want to read to you an excerpt from a Bible dictionary that I use, uh, Vine's Expository Bible Notes. And it says this, Praise the Lord is found throughout the book of Psalms. But each of the last five Psalms, Psalms 146 to 150, begins and ends with praise the Lord. And we're going to look at those Psalms in a little moment. This is a fitting close to the book of Psalms because Psalm 1 begins with God blessing us. And Psalm 150 closes with us blessing God. When we come to the conclusion of all of God's wonderful blessings to us, the words to truly express our gratitude are praise the Lord or hallelujah. I'm going to read that sentence again because it's awesome. When we come to the conclusion of all God's wonderful blessings to us, the words to truly express our gratitude are praise the Lord or hallelujah. Psalm 150 is a prediction of what every child of God will be doing throughout eternity. It is also a prescription setting before us directions for praising the Lord. Now, the book of Psalms, it's the longest book in the Bible, and it's made up of 150 poems or songs, and these 150 poems or songs, they vary in length, they vary in theme, there's a wide range of emotions, and they're also written by a number of different authors. But the phrase hallelujah keeps coming up, or in my English translation, the phrase praise the Lord keeps coming up. And what we've just read from the Vines Dictionary is that the last five Psalms in this collection expand on this theme of Hallelujah. And if you have a chance this week, I'd encourage you to take a long coffee break and read those last five Psalms in the book of Psalms. I'm sure to be a blessing to you. So we're not going to read them in full today, but rather we're going to hit on some highlights that are helpful. But within Psalms 146 to 150, there's some helpful insight. This collection is sometimes known as the Hallelujah Psalms. And as I approached them, as I got into them to try and bring something helpful for us today, I had two questions on my mind. The first is, how should we practice Hallelujah? And the second is, why does this matter? Why, how do we practice this? How do we do it? How do we express a hallelujah? And the second is, why does any of this matter? Do these psalms or this word give us any insight that can build a life of faith on? What is it that I can gather from this? Why does any of this matter? And the first thing I couldn't ignore in these psalms that are bookended by the phrase hallelujah is the passion contained within these five psalms. There is deep passion that is easy to observe. How is a hallelujah expressed or practiced? I would say it is expressed and it is practiced with passion. Psalm 146 verse 5. 
But joyful are those who have the Lord God of Israel as their helper, whose hope is in the Lord their God. Praise the Lord. How good to sing praises to our God. How delightful and how fitting. Sing out your thanks to the Lord. Sing praises to our God with a harp. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praises in the assembly of the faithful. O Israel, rejoice in your maker. O people of Jerusalem, exult in your king. Praise his name with dancing accompanied by tambourine and harp. Praise him with a blast of the ram's horn. Praise him with a lyre and harp. Praise him with a tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flutes. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now there's nothing polite or quiet or reserved or held back about what we just read. We were about dancing and singing and instruments and harps and horns and clashes of cymbals. This idea that there's a passion that we can see as these psalms that are embodied with this idea of a hallelujah, what we can see very plain as day is that there is a passion that drives these psalms. There is a, there is a passion buried within this idea of hallelujah. This idea of passion is something that I love thinking about, I love talking about. And one of the things that we can't do and that is a mistake for us is to mix up passion with excitement. Passion and excitement are not the same things. See, excitement we can measure in volume. If it's loud, it's exciting. But passion is not measured in how loud it is. Passion is measured in endurance, not volume. Passion is not measured in volume. Things can be loud and wild and exciting. That doesn't mean they're passionate. It just means that they're exciting for a moment. So I don't know if your kids are anything like mine, but um, if ever they get invited to a birthday party, it is the greatest thing ever. And when they go, they go absolutely psycho. And what they need more than anything else, is a little bit more sugar just to tip things over the edge. But that's excitement. It's hype. Yeah, they're all hype. There's a bounce house. There's a guy doing magic tricks. Yes, they're hype. It's a kid's birthday party. To drive home, they all fall asleep. That's excitement. It's not passion. Here we are, Super Bowl Sunday. And all of you know, a sports fan that is die hard. That may be you. You may be a diehard sports fan. The first app you open on your phone in the morning is ESPN. And you're checking out how your team's doing. You're checking out the news to see if anything happened overnight that is earth shattering. I can at least say the Premier League has a time difference. So it makes sense me checking it first thing in the morning. But that's another story. And then you have sports fans that when their team is doing well, suddenly they get in the jersey out of the closet. In England, we call them fair weather fans. Is that an expression used here, like a fair weather fan? Like when things are going well, oh, I'm number one fan, have been this whole time. That's excitement. It's not passion. Passion is going to get you through seasons. Passion cuts through the ups and downs. Passion is all buried, it is all absorbed in, 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 in endurance and persistence and the, the ability to keep going is what I'm trying to say. It's this ability to keep going. It doesn't, it's not affected, it's not swayed by the circumstances. Rather than a kid's birthday party or a fair weather sports fan, it's more like those stories you hear about a musician or an author that for years have been rejected after rejection after rejection. An author that tries taking their manuscript to a publishing house, and the publishing house wants nothing to do with it. And dozens of publishers reject the manuscript, and then finally they get there. That's passion. It's the musician who for years has gone and played different bands and live on small gigs and all the stuff, and it never quite goes anywhere, and then finally they get a break. They get to do a big gig somewhere. That's passion that keeps people going. That is the kind of passion I believe we read about in the Bible, specifically in the Psalms we read today. It's not a passion that is dependent on the right circumstances. It is a passion that far supersedes that because it drives and it builds endurance in our lives. The loud expression that we find in the Psalms isn't the cause or the proof of passion, but it is a response. Declaring hallelujah in passionate praise is a response. And that brought me to my next question. What causes this response? The volume is not the proof. The volume is not what we're focusing on. The volume is not the measurement of how committed we are to God. It's not the volume. It's not the, it's, that, that's not what we're consumed with. But rather, what is causing that expression? What is causing that passion in our lives? And underneath this psalm, the group of psalms that we've read is an essential belief that God is worthy. In this small collection of psalms, it's impossible to miss that this passion that is being evoked, this passion that is coming, is because he's worthy. It's explained and it's justified and it's understood and it makes sense because he's worthy. Here's a few verses. Psalm 146, verse six. 
He made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He keeps every promise forever. He gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. The Lord loves the godly. The Lord protects the foreigners among us. He cares for the orphans and widows, but he frustrates the plans of the wicked. Psalm 147. He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. He counts the stars and calls them by name. How great is our Lord. His power is absolute. His understanding is far beyond comprehension. The Lord supports the humble, but he brings the wicked down into the dust. 148. Let every created thing give praise to the Lord, for he issued his command, and they came into being. He set them in place forever and ever. His decree will never be revoked. Psalm 150. Praise him for his mighty works. Praise his unequaled greatness. I love that expression, his unequaled greatness. And building this passion in our lives means that there's a sincere understanding that he and he alone is worthy. To have that passion, it's rooted in a confidence that God is worthy of praise, worthy of adoration. Now, if you're anything like me, if, uh, does anybody update their cell phone regularly and it's like something you look forward to? I'm, I'm, I surely I'm not the only one. Okay, good, good. So there's something about when you get a new cell phone, you treat it like a newborn baby. You're extra careful with it. You're all kinds of enamored with the new bells and whistles that the new phone has that your old one won't have. But fast forward a few weeks, and you've got the kids saying, hey, Dad, can I play Angry Birds? And he's like, yeah, there you go. You know what I mean? Like, that passion lessens over time. It weakens over time. And it doesn't matter what it is. It could be a new car. It could be a new outfit or something. But when it first comes, when it's new and it's shiny, man, that is something that we're all kinds of passionate about. We take care of it. We tend to it. We make sure that nothing bad happens to it. But over a period of time, it's easy come, easy go. That's not passion. That's excitement. What we just read about here is the worthiness of God to have this, this, this absolute devotion from us. The worthiness of God that he deserves all praise, all glory, all honor. The intensity of having a new phone, new car, whatever it is, lessens over time. But the passion that drives praise for God is never ending. And that's what's underlying the hallelujah. We can see that in these Psalms. In those Psalms that we read, the verses that I shared with you, we see that God, he made the heaven and the earth. He keeps every promise. He gives justice to the oppressed. He heals the brokenhearted. His power is absolute. His greatness is unequaled. We will never run out of reasons to praise God. That's what I took from this. We will never run out of reasons to praise God. And remembering this, reminding ourselves and each other about this, realizing some new reasons to praise God that all builds passion that endures a passion that is rooted in how unequally worthy he is. Well, hallelujah, the, the word itself, as I share with you, the, the two definitions that make up those two words that are in hallelujah. It does mean praise the Lord, and the portion of the word for Lord is, is Yah, so we pronounce the J as a Y, and Yah is seen many times in Old Testament Hebrew names like Elijah, uh, and in English we hit the J, and Elijah, for what it's worth, is a great name for a firstborn son. If you're unaware, my oldest son's called Elijah. But the name Elijah, this will help bring some understanding. So Elijah is made up of two words also. So it's El, which is the word for general, general word for God. And then Yah, or as we say, Jah, which is Yahweh. It's an abbreviated form of Yahweh, which is the Lord. So Elijah is Yahweh is God, or the Lord is God. So that's the name Elijah. And I want to take some time to consider the significance of the name Yahweh. Because it's important in our attempt to have a full understanding of hallelujah. That J-A-H that's packed in there is that name Yahweh is the abbreviated form. The name Yahweh is used a number of times in the Bible. And one of the most significant is in this moment in the life of Moses. And for what it's worth, Moses is a great name for a youngest son. My youngest son is called Moses. But I want to hit on uh, Exodus 3. And Exodus 3, so the book of Exodus, it's the second book in the Bible. The first book is Genesis. And then you have a 400-year gap, and then you come to the book of Exodus. And in that 400 years, God's people, God's chosen people, the descendants of Abraham, they were in slavery in Egypt. And while they're in slavery, I think it makes total sense that the stories that we now can read in the book of Genesis is what they would tell each other around the campfire at night. After a brutal day of slave labor... They'd gather together and they'd share the stories that you and I can read about in Genesis. And it would be a source of encouragement to these Hebrews. That they would tell the stories about the promises that were given to Abraham. 
the great descendant, how Jacob, he also had promises, and how Isaac was involved in that, and what happened with Noah, and all the things that, you know, an explanation about why is the world messed up? Why is there injustice in the world? Well, let's talk about Eden again, and how sin first crept into the world. Let's talk about these stories, and help them make sense of what the world was like around them, and how they are to live as a people of promise. And Moses, he was a Hebrew boy that was born uh, in Egypt, and he was placed in a basket in the Nile, and uh, you may know the story well, but he ended up going down to the river and ended up growing up in Pharaoh's palace. And then one day, he kills an Egyptian to try and protect a fellow Hebrew man. And when he's found out, he goes on the run. He gets caught killing somebody, heads on the run, and for 40 years, he's tending to some sheep. And one day, he sees a burning bush that's not being consumed by the fire. And a voice calls to Moses from the fire, And this is what he hears. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering. God then lays out his promise to deliver his people out of slavery and into freedom. And then he lets Moses know how Moses is going to be involved in all this. Now go, for I am sending you, Moses, to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. And we're going to pick this up in verse 11 of Exodus 3. But Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. But Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me, they will ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Now go and call together all the elders of Israel. Tell them, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me. He told me, I've been watching closely, and I see how the Egyptians are treating you. I have promised to rescue you from your oppression in Egypt. I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, God's appearance and consequently introduction to Moses that he's to share with the people is a pivotal moment in the biblical story. And God makes an enormous promise in this moment through the burning bush. So Moses, he says, before they follow me, this is Moses' objection, They're going to want to know who you are. They're going to want to know a little more about all this. They're not just going to take my word from it that there was a bush. It was on fire. It wasn't burning up, though. And they're just going to do whatever I say because of this story. They're going to want to know a little more. They want to know more about you. And God says to tell them, I am who I am. And it's helpful to think about that expression, I am who I am this way, is that I am who I am is I will be who I've always been, and I will do what I've always done. And what has God done? Who has he shown himself to be? He's a promise maker. I am who I am. I am who I've always been. I will do what I've always done. And what has he always done? He has made promises. And even better, he's kept promises. And this is the Exodus story. That every promise given to Moses is fulfilled in the following pages. If you know the story, and I'm sure many of you do, the Israelites do escape Egypt. The Israelites do find freedom as they cross through the Red Sea. They do worship at the mountain just as God promised. And they do eventually enter the promised land. In the book of Exodus, we start to see the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob being fulfilled. And this is such a significant moment that every time you and I hear the word, the name Yahweh, it points us back to this key introduction to Moses. At the burning bush, we get this reminder of who God is. And it's a reminder that he is a promise maker. And more importantly, he's a promise keeper. When we declare hallelujah, It means remembering the name of God. And the name of God reminds us of moments like this where God makes and keeps promises. We just read it a moment ago in Psalm 146, verse 6. He keeps every promise forever. In short, praising God means remembering his promises. The basic definition of hallelujah is praise the Lord. And I'm certainly not an expert in Hebrew. Uh, One of the things they taught us in Bible college, we did an intro to Hebrew class. And one of the things that the professor told us is that when you're learning Hebrew, the first 11 years is the easiest. That turned me off right away. But I was able to find this out. And this really got me thinking this week. And I'm happy to share it with you. So we talked about the word halal, which means praise. But in hallelujah, it's hallelujah. 
And that means, let us praise. See, I read a word that I'd never heard before, or a term I heard this uh, before, was a plural imperative positive verb. Now, I had no idea what that meant. Thank God for Google. What I read is, is that it's a command for multiple people to do something. Halal means to praise. Hallelujah is let us praise. It's a collective command. All of us together, we are now going to do something. We are now going to praise. Let us praise. So rather than saying hallelujah, meaning praise the Lord, it would be more accurate to say hallelujah means let us praise the Lord. It's a declaration for the community. It evokes a togetherness that along with the rest of us, along with the rest of the gang, along with the rest of the community of faith, we are now going to praise the Lord. It brings a collectivity to it. It brings togetherness. It builds community that we are now going to praise the Lord together. Let us praise the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that if we say it and there's no one else in the room, we're doing anything wrong. It just means that we're connecting ourselves to a much bigger picture. When we're, on our, we're by ourselves and God is moving and he's doing something good in our lives and he's bringing about something positive that he's fulfilling our promises and we can see it and we can acknowledge it and we declare hallelujah, it connects us to all the believers around the world who are also experiencing God fulfilling his promises. It means it's a reminder to us that this is a collective thing that we're part of. This is a community thing that we're a part of. Our life and what's going on in our lives and how God's moving in our life, it is a small picture compared to what is happening when all of us together have God moving and fulfilling his promises in our lives. It reminds us that we are collected together with other believers all over the planet. The sense of togetherness, community, is vital. We're not by ourselves in this. It builds passion in our faith. As we consider and reflect and share the wonders of God that He alone is worthy, that He is faithful in keeping His promises. And as we declare... Let us praise the Lord. It causes others to stir their passion, remembering that He is worthy. It's a reminder to all of us of His promises. And that core definition of hallelujah is simply hallelujah is praise the Lord or let us praise the Lord. But in light of what we just considered, I think there's a fuller definition that can help us. I want to piece together of everything that we've looked at so far, that idea of being together, that idea of passion, that idea of God alone being worthy, about his promises being the forefront of our mind. And at first we have that plural imperative, that positive verb together, together we will now, is what we get from this, together we will now. That's what's at the root of this, together we will now, let's go. And from the Psalms, we can't possibly miss the passion to loudly and passionately declare praise and adoration. And who should we do this for? Who deserves this praise? Who alone is worthy? The only one who is worthy, the Lord God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And why? Because he is Yahweh, the one that makes promises. He faithfully makes and keeps his promises to us. And this gives us a more complete definition. The hallelujah is together we will now loudly and passionately declare praise and adoration to the only one who is worthy, the Lord God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, who faithfully makes and keeps his promises to us. The Old Testament was mostly written in Hebrew and the New Testament, which makes up about the last quarter of the Bible. That was written in Greek. In the New Testament, it begins at the life of Jesus and continues on to the early church and ends with the book of Revelation, which describes how life is going to be as the Lord prepares his return to come back and wrap this whole thing up. But the Old Testament, it existed in the time of Jesus and was acknowledged and recognized as being the Holy Scriptures, as being sacred, about being holy, about being divinely inspired. That was recognized about the Old Testament as we have it today. And there was a period of time where the Old Testament was translated into the language of the time from Hebrew into Greek. And so at the time of the life of Jesus, there was an existence of the Old Testament in Greek that they had to be able to draw from. And so consequently, when they came to the word hallelujah, they had to translate it from Hebrew into Greek. And the Hebrew word uh, hallelujah is translated into hallelujah in Greek. Now, the Greek word, hallelujah, is only seen in one passage in the whole Old Testament. And so, excuse me, in the whole New Testament. In the New Testament, the word hallelujah or hallelujah is mentioned one time. And it's in the book of Revelation, chapter 19. It's only mentioned one time. It's four times in that chapter. 
In the book of Revelation, it's one of the longer books in the New Testament. It's not necessarily an easy read, but if ever you spend time reading it, one of the things that will instantly pop out at you is that there's all kinds of dramatic imagery of the genre of book that was written at the time, of all this dramatic imagery about how life is all going to go and things. But at its core, the book talks about God's eternal victory and gives hope for those who have pledged their faith and loyalty to Jesus and who never give up. And we're going to pick up in chapter 19, and there's been a significant victory over the power of evil. Chapter 18 describes the destruction of the evil city that's been given the name Babylon. So this is following a notable victory, and I put hallelujah where my translation had put hallelujah or praise the Lord. So I added hallelujah so that we can get the punch of this today. Revelation 19 verse 1. After this, I heard what sounded like a vast crowd in heaven shouting, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. His judgments are true and just. He has punished the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality. He has avenged the murder of his servants. And again, their voices rang out, Hallelujah. The smoke from that city ascends forever and ever. Then the 24 elders and four living beings fell down and worshiped God who was sitting on the throne. They cried out, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the great throne came a voice that said, Praise our God, all his servants, all who fear him, from the least to the greatest. Then I heard again what sounded like a shout of a vast crowd, or the roar of mighty ocean waves, or the crash of loud thunder. Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, and let's give honor to him. Simple takeaway. Declaring hallelujah keeps us grounded in eternity. Declaring hallelujah keeps us grounded in eternity. Every time we sing hallelujah here on earth, it might be helpful to remember that this declaration is ringing throughout heaven, celebrating the victory of Jesus. And as much as we may declare this here on earth, we will say it many more times in eternity. There's a a newer song that's been released a month or so ago. It's very very new by uh, someone called Brooke Frazier. And she wrote this song, and I wanted to read a couple of lyrics to you that are really poignant. Who else would die for our redemption? Whose resurrection means I'll rise? There isn't time to sing of all you've done, but I have eternity to try. With a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. This eternal perspective. It was also part of God's appearance to Moses at the burning bush. Say this to the people of Israel. Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Psalm 146, verse 6. He keeps every promise forever. Jesus' life and mission fulfilled what the Old Testament started. And the message of Jesus is an eternal message. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 24. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. One of the things that Jesus taught about regularly was not getting consumed with the cares of today. Here's a few examples. So don't worry about these things, saying what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Chapter 16, then Jesus said to the disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? And this from the parable of the sower, one of the cautionary examples of how not to respond to the message of Jesus. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. But declaring hallelujah keeps us grounded in eternity. The remedy for being consumed with this life and consumed with the temporal is to shift to an eternal perspective. The vast crowd in heaven declares the victory. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. This is the cry of heaven. This is the declaration of eternity. And when we declare hallelujah in worship or moments of praise, we are grounding ourselves in eternity. Every time we declare hallelujah, 
I hope it spurs a passion and love for Jesus, that it reminds our hearts all over again about his indescribable majesty and goodness and the love that he has for us and that his promises are being fulfilled and that we will experience the complete fulfillment of these promises in eternity. That is the power of declaring hallelujah. Hallelujah. Together, we will now loudly and passionately declare praise and adoration to the only one who is worthy, the Lord God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, who faithfully makes and keeps his promises to us. Remember that passion is measured in endurance, not volume. We will never run out of reasons to praise God. Praising God means remembering his promises and declaring hallelujah keeps us grounded in eternity. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Are we going to take a few moments? Are we going to go back into a time of worship? I feel it's appropriate that after talking about hallelujah, we do some hallelujah ring. So I invite you at this time, when you go ahead, let's stand. And we're not closing out service, but we are going to take some time and we're going to worship and we're going to declare hallelujah. We're going to passionately declare hallelujah. Real passion, not temporary excitement. We're going to praise his name, the only one that is worthy. We're going to remember that this name, the Yahweh, it is connected indistinguishably from great promises that only he can keep. That he is worthy unlike anyone else. And that this is being echoed throughout eternity. So come on everybody, let's worship together. So I throw on my hands, praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I've nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing high.
Let's take a moment together. That's what we heard. Together, this idea of a hallelujah is that together we are going to praise the Lord. That He and He alone is worthy. That the praise that is appropriate and right is passionate, not just loud for the sake of being loud and excitable, but deep passion that cuts through the seasons of life. Remembering that His name is synonymous with promise. Not empty promises, but promises that He is faithful to complete. When we declare hallelujah, when we worship and we say a hallelujah, there's a togetherness filled with passion that He's worthy and that His promises are good. Amen. I've got a couple of questions. You guys can go ahead and grab a seat. There's a couple of questions that take a note of these, write them down, put them in your phone. Maybe you have a chance this week to think about these, reflect on these, pray about it. The first one is, how is your belief that God is worthy of praise building passion in your faith? That's a mouthful, I'll say it again. How is your belief that God is worthy of all praise building passion in your life? And the second question, How would being grounded in eternity change how you live today? If we started to have an eternal perspective, remembering that that hallelujah is ringing throughout all of eternity, that is the cry of heaven is hallelujah. If we grab onto that, latch onto that, how would it change how we live today? We talked a little about eternity. I wanna share with you a Bible verse that is probably the most well-known Bible verse in the whole Bible. It's John 3, 16. Many of you will know this very well. For this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent His Son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through Him. And you may have heard many times or you may have never heard that Jesus came to save people that need saving. And who needs saving? Anyone that has any regrets, done any mistakes, put one foot wrong, said anything out of place, stolen anything, ever lied. Now I'm confident to say, that's everybody. Everybody needs a savior. We need a savior. I don't like thinking about an eternity distance from God. I don't like thinking about an eternity that is away from God and outside of His goodness and outside of His love and outside of His compassion and outside of His blessing, outside of declaring hallelujah again and again and being in His presence and feeling healed, holding, complete. I hate thinking about it. And the Bible talks about hell and we, we, hell has got all kinds of misrepresentations in the world today, but let me tell you, I hate thinking about it. But I would also be lying to you if I said it wasn't a reality. God has no desire that any should spend eternity away from Him. And He sent His Son so that you and I could have a choice. That when we stand before God, that God will say, you know what, I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to judge my Son that you've put your trust in. You've put your trust in my Son, His goodness, His purity, His innocence, His absolute perfection, His complete sinlessness. For anyone that says, judge Him instead of me, God finds innocent and is able to stand righteous in His sight and is welcomed into eternity with Him. For anyone that rejects Jesus, I don't want the gospel message. I don't want the message. It breaks God's heart that they've chosen eternity away from Him. I can't sugarcoat the reality of the Christian message. I hate thinking about it. It fills me with dread, but it's the reality. I would rather emphasize the good news of Jesus than the bad news of hell. But without the reality of the bad news of hell, the good news of Jesus just isn't quite so sweet. 
We don't deserve eternity with him, but he gives it lavishly to anyone that would call upon his name. And we read that John 3, 16 again. This is how God loved the world. He gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him, not everyone that's earned it, not everyone that's done enough, not everyone that's cleaned themselves up, everyone who believes in him, puts their trust, faith, and confidence in him, will not perish, will not have an eternity that keeps me up at night, but will have eternal life with him. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world, because we need a savior. We need a savior. I want to invite everyone here to close your eyes and bow your heads. This is just to give privacy to everyone around you. But if this is the moment, this is the day where you're ready, life has got you to this point where you're ready to say, you know what? I need a savior. I need a savior. I've never put my trust and put my confidence in Jesus. Or maybe I did one time when, but that loyalty is long gone. It's time to renew that commitment to him today. I would love to pray for you. And I give you my word. We're not going to do anything weird. We're not going to do anything to make you uncomfortable. But when we pray together as a church in just a moment, I'd love to know who I'm praying for. So if this is you today, you want security, you want your relationship with God healed and restored, you want security for your eternity, I'd love to pray for you. So if that's you today, could you just put your hand up in the air? I'd love to know who I'm praying for. Amen. Anybody else here? Thank you. Anyone else? I promise I won't embarrass you, but I'd love to know who I'm praying for today. Anybody else? Awesome. Online, you can just click the button that says, I've raised my hand, and you're definitely going to be included. Amen. I don't want to prolong this, but I don't want to close the window. If this is a moment where you'd say, Tom, I'm ready, just put your hand up just for a moment. I'd love to pray for you. Amen. Amen. Come on, Word of Life. Let's celebrate people making the best decision they could ever make in here. But we're going to pray this prayer, and we do this at the end of every service. The words are going to be on the screen. I'm going to say something, and then I'd appreciate it if you just yell it back with passion, with confidence that a prayer like this has the power to change lives. Come on, everybody. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me. I want to follow you. I invite you to be Lord of my life. Help me follow you every day. I want to leave my old life of sin behind and heal my broken relationship with God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on in one more time. Let's celebrate with people who made that decision. Amen. Come on, everybody. Let's welcome back Nick as he helps us figure out some next steps. Thanks, Nick. Amen. Uh, great that we get to celebrate new creations in Christ, right? The old has passed, the new has come. Um, what a blessing. I uh, wanna just make sure that we are uh, thinking about some next steps as we leave here today. Uh, we talked about life groups and today being the very first day of life group signups. There's also an opportunity for one-on-one um, -on -one coaching if you're interested in that. The prayer team is coming down as well. And if you just really need that opportunity to pray with someone, uh, something's going on in your life, really encourage you to do that. If you're online, uh, make sure that you click um, raise the hand. The chat hoster were there to help pray with you as well. Um, want to remind you, uh, last week we had a, we heard a great sermon from Dan McLaughlin around tithing. If you are here to give your tithe, you can either do that online um, by clicking church center or leave it in the black boxes at the back. And I think that's it for today. So um, again, I, I encourage you, you know, maybe you see these people that are sitting up here and like, ah, oh, you know what? I really want to go um, down, but maybe I, I don't know how they're going to feel. They, they have been praying all service for you. Um, so they're in the mindset to, um, to pray and I I promise you the Lord will speak through them. So uh, let's close in prayer. Lord, I thank you so much uh, for this day. I thank you for uh, a word of passion, uh, of coming to you in praise and a passionate praise to you. I thank you that uh, we don't do it just with excitement, but we do it from the very depths of our heart, singing out praise and honor and glory and power to your name, Lord. I pray that as we go throughout the week, that would be the mantra that we live a passionate life for you, Lord, in everything that we do. We thank you, we honor, and we glorify you this morning. In the name of Jesus, all God's people said, amen. Have a great week.